In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the Feast of St. Rose of Lima. She had a great love and devotion to St. Catherine of Siena, and she lived in the early 1600s. She's the first canonized saint of South America. She's one of the great first fruits of Catholic Spain, who brought the faith, the cross, the mass, the sacraments, the true doctrine to the light of the barbarian nations here, the barbarian savage Indian tribes and the pagan practices. And even in the North America here, cannibalism was part of their rituals and satanic rituals. And of course, we all know about Mexico ripping the hearts out to the gods of the sun and the moon, to the serpent god. But in South America also, deep in South America, there's all evidence of human sacrifices. And this is what paganism does. And we, don't, we can't fold our arms and say, well, those people were pretty barbaric. Because we are more barbaric than any of them. We're killing now how many millions? Up to 60 millions of babies since in the United States since 1973, since it was legalized. So ex the, only, the only exception is our time is more hypocritical because we're killing our babies with germ-free tools and nice, clean, uh, antiseptic, cleaned hospital rooms and utensils that are, of course, disinfected so they don't cause any germs and infection. And here, this is the way we're ripping out and killing our babies. So... So for Spain to bring the faith and plant the cross, and Our Lady backed the work of Spain by appearing right in the middle of North and South America, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary, who appears on the mountain called the Crusher of the Serpent. That's what Guadalupe in its original language means, the Crusher of the Serpent, which is the role of the Virgin Mary chosen by God. So paganism is only overcome by the truth and usually a lot of blood, the blood of martyrs and with the help of the Virgin Mary. So let's look at one of the early martyrs. St. Rose of Lima is the flower, but uh, today is also the feast of St. Felix and Adactius. And St. Felix was captured for being... Catholic, of course, and he was taken before the statues of Jupiter and Mars and I think another one of the other goddesses. And at each time, at each time, he spat at the statue and the statue just fell to pieces right before their eyes. So they, they accused him of magic. So they brought him before the second statue of Jupiter, whoever, and told him, burn incense to the gods. If you're going to be patriotic, you must burn incense to the gods. But the, these great saints show us where true patriotism really lives, uh, really lies. It's not in supporting the errors of one's nation. And we Americans are in the same situation. We cannot burn incense to the gods of separation of church and state, to liberty of press, liberty of speech, liberty of conscience, liberty of teaching what you want. These liberties in the hands of the Freemasons, in the hands of the enemies of Christ, are used to destroy the truth and uh, mislead souls by the millions into error, darkness, and finally into hell. So the second time St. Felix spat at the statue, and the statue also crumbled, and the third time it crumbled, so they ended up torturing him and, and beheading him. But on his way to being martyred, there was another Catholic in the crowds and he worked his way into the crowds and he walked up to St. Felix and he said, I also, to the guards, he said, I also profess his same faith and I follow the same laws, the Ten Commandments and the laws of God and his church, his holy Catholic church. So they arrested him and they didn't even know the name of this stranger. He was probably, I don't know, traveling through and he realized what was going on 
and he professed the Catholic faith. So he was added to be martyred and beheaded with St. Felix. So since history never knew the name of the saint, he was just called Audacius, which means added to, added to the martyrdom of St. Felix. So let's pray to these great saints, and let's imitate their holy stubbornness. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas raises the question whether unbelievers may have authority or dominion over the faithful. And what he says is very interesting. He makes a distinction. And he says, those who are in authority can pronounce judgment on those over whom they are placed. But unbelievers cannot pronounce judgment on the faithful, that is, those who profess the Catholic faith. For the Apostle says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to be judged before the unjust, that is, unbelievers, and not before the saints. Therefore it seems that unbelievers cannot have authority over the faithful. So St. Thomas will say in his, his answer this question, to this question, he says, we may consider this in two ways. First, we may speak of dominion or authority of unbelievers over the faithful as of a thing to be established for the first time. And he says with this, this cannot be. We cannot accept to have uh, infidels, pagans, and those of false religions rule over us. This ought by no means to be allowed, he says, since it would provoke scandal and endanger the faith for subjects are easily influenced by their superiors to comply with their commands, unless the subjects are of great virtue. So we see, for example, St. Rose of Lima today. Her parents really wanted her to get married. She made a vow to be virgin since she was five years old. And she would never break that vow. She was married to Christ. And she, she took hot pepper and s scraped her face with it to disfigure her skin and face so as to dissuade her parents and, any, and dissuade any guy from wanting to marry her. So it took great virtue for her to stand up. But that was still a Catholic society, Catholic parents. But even greater virtue in St. Felix and Adachius today, their, their feast today, the, the great virtue to resist the, the persecution of the emperors of Rome. So he's saying that under these kind of rulers, it takes great virtue to practice virtue, keep the faith, and save your soul. Moreover, he says, St. Thomas, unbelievers hold the faith in contempt if they see the faithful fall away. Hence, the apostle forbade the faithful to go to law or court before an unbelieving judge. And so the church altogether forbids unbelievers to acquire dominion over believers or to have authority over them in any capacity whatsoever. And then uh, St. Thomas goes on to make the, the next distinction. But I just want to dwell on this first distinction and apply it to our situation now. Because now we not only have political rulers who impose on us a new religion, a false religion, which is the religion that there is no religion. That's the religion of, of the modern world, of modern governments. That there is no one religion. All are equal before the state. All have equal opportunity to spread their propaganda, to preach what they want to say practice what they want to do as long as it doesn't harm anybody or cause disorder. And this this what's called indifferentism by Pope Leo the Thirteenth and Pope St. Pius the Tenth and uh, Gregory the Sixteenth and Pius the Ninth, they all condemn this as the most harmful error. And and they say, Leo the Thirteenth says very clearly, if all religions are treated equal, then all religions in the eyes of the state and all people of common sense, they see religion as just for the birds. And it leads logically to atheism, that there is no true God, because you have all these different religions with different beliefs, different contradictory statements. They all can't be true if, they're all, if they all contradict each other. Therefore, they're all equally false. 
and the state promotes atheism. And that's a fact. That's what we're under now. And that's bad enough if the political rulers do this. But we still must profess the Catholic faith and profess only one true religion. And that our state and that our United States government has the duty to profess the Roman Catholic faith and profess Jesus Christ, the only true God who took on flesh and redeemed us on the cross and established his one church. The, the, the U.S. leaders and the leaders of all governments must adore and acknowledge and profess the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way it is. And there used to be a time when leaders of society did this. And the blessings and the benefits and the fruit of it, we still bask in the light of that age. All politeness, all honor in war, all, all, uh, all respect for anything sacred and good still left in the modern world is thanks to that age of the Catholic faith, which is called the ages of the faith. Now let's apply this, what he says here, to the war situation which we are in now, to modernist Rome, to popes who are promoting ecumenism, promoting that, that all religions can be vehicles of the Holy Ghost. This is what Vatican II teaches. And that says also the Muslims adore the same God as the Catholics. That's false. That's absolutely false. So St. Thomas says, here, subjects are easily influenced by their superiors to comply with their commands unless the subjects are of great virtue. So, what are the superiors in the Catholic Church slash now conciliar church? What are they imposing on us? What do they demand from all of us Catholics to accept the Second Vatican Council and the new Mass and all the reforms that come from it? And thanked, thanked Almighty God and the Blessed Virgin Mary, God raised up a great saint of our time, Archbishop Lefebvre. And Archbishop Lefebvre saw through this farce. And he says, even if he is the Pope, even if he has the fullest and highest authority on the earth, which he does, he cannot oblige us to lose our Catholic faith. And that's why we, he has a right to our open and public resistance and our disobedience, because he's demanding of us obedience to a new theology, a new mass, a new priesthood, a new Bible, ecumenical Bible, a new rite of sacraments, a new religion. And they themselves call it a new religion, the, the Church of the New Advent, the Church of the New Pentecost, the Conciliar Church. So, to stay faithful to our Holy Father the Pope, we have to disobey him, and we have to stay faithful to all of Catholic tradition. And, and, and it was thanks to Archbishop Lefebvre who guided us through this mess, because even now Catholics are confused, but we're supposed to obey the Pope. Well, yeah, but if he's pushing on you a faith different from tradition, we must disobey him. Well, if we have to disobey him, then he must not be Pope, instead of Icontism. Well, no, because you can have a bad leader. You can have a bad father, a bad fa bu businessman. You can have a bad boss. You can have a bad president. You can have a bad pope. That doesn't go against Catholic teaching. And in fact, when you look at history, in the last thousand years, how many canonized saints have there been that were popes? <laughs> Think about that. Other than the... the absurdity of Vatican II. Let's just take from Pius XII, a thousand years before him, how many canonized popes? Only four. Only four. St. Gregory VII, I think St. Urban I, um, Pius X, of course, and Pius V. Those four in a thousand years. So that teaches us a lot. One, St. Popes are rare. Two, worldly popes or not saint popes are more common. So you can have popes that are very human and may not fulfill their role as perfectly as a saint pope, but they're still popes. 
And the absurdity is, since Vatican, since Vatican II, we've got all these canonized, suddenly, what, four or five canonized popes in a row. And it's obviously a farce. It's obviously a move to justify the conciliar religion. Who, and these are the founders of the conciliar religion. John, John the Twenty-Third, Paul the Sixth, who pushed the new mass, John Paul II, and Bish, uh, Car, uh, Pope Benedict XVI. They'll probably canonize him before he dies. And then Pope Francis, they're probably already working on his canonization. At least he is. <laughs> so this is, it's a farce, and you can see it. Because all tradition condemns this behavior, it condemns this teaching, it condemns this conciliar <coughs> religion. So where do we need to stand? We need to stand, again, on that clear clear stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. And he was a blessing. He really was, because he was sound in theology. He was sound in his judgments. He had good prudential uh, judgments. I don't say he was infallible in every decision and everything he did, but he certainly gave us doctrinally the light to cut through this confusion. So that's why he says, what do we do in this situation? <clears throat> Steer far away from modernist Rome. Stay away from Vatican II. Stay away from the new mass. Don't get involved with it. Don't try to make peace with it. Don't try to negotiate with it. Don't try to dialogue with it to look at Vatican II in the light of tradition. Forget it. Forget it. You just can't do it. You can't take a pile of cow manure and turn it to something edible. It just cannot happen. And this is what they're trying to do. Bishop Fillet and the leaders of the SSPX trying to see the Vatican II in the light of tradition when the whole thing is poisoned through and through. Archbishop Lefebvre said that. The whole thing is poisoned through and through. So what did he tell his priests in the book that was his last testament, the book called The Spiritual Journey? It was really meant for his priests, but you can read it and draw much fruit from it. But in there he says, for any of us, especially priests, to preserve the Catholic faith, we must steer far away from the Second Vatican Council and the reforms that came from it, including that new Mass. And never bless it, never call darkness light, Never call evil good. Never call poison something healthy. And this is what the deceptions, those who have made agreements with Rome, and that's up to now 12 or 13 groups of priests and nuns, they've all succumbed to being poisoned by Vatican II. And it's happening now to our dear SSPX, so sadly, so very sadly. So pray for all the priests and... But, but uh, refasten your minds, all of us. Try to read the good works of Archbishop Lefebvre to steer in this confusion. And let's imitate the holy stubbornness of St. Felix, who would not burn incense to the false gods. He died for the faith. It's, it, and that's what we need to be ready to do. It's better to die for the truth than try to split it, compromise it, and give false distinctions to justify apostasy. So let's pray to the Mother of God, her Holy Rosary. She knew these days would be here, and we're in them. She warned us about them, but she gave us the weapons to, to steer through it. And that is, stay faithful to Catholic tradition, hold the line of all the popes of tradition, keep the daily rosary, wear her scapular, and through the, through the rosary, she promises all the graces you need to save your soul, to settle any problem. She told Sister Lucia, there is no problem, whether it be personal, family, city-wise, national or international, or with, within congregations of priests or nuns, no, no problem that cannot be solved by praying the rosary. So these are the weapons of our, of our age, the 59 bullet machine gun. Pray it devoutly every day, and I, I know all you do, but we always need to be reminded, all of us, and try to say it more devoutly each time and addressing the Mother of God, because every Hail Mary is powerful. Every Hail Mary shakes heaven and earth. The saints have told other saints on earth, if I could come down from heaven, 
And even if I had to suffer till the end of the world, just for the merit of one Hail Mary, I would gladly do it. The power of just one Ave Maria. So let's proceed now to the sacrifice of the Mass. Beg the Virgin Mary, teach me how to adore Christ, to love Him with all my heart, as you did at the foot of the cross. And at the, and, and at the foot of the altar in heaven right now, the Mass is eternally going on. The eternal sacrifice of the Mass. Christ is always offering His wounds to the Father. Always. It's the eternal Mass. So we step into that Mass in the Mass on earth. Heaven and earth unite. And that's why with our angels, with Our Lady, we want to really beg this Lamb of God, sacrificed on the cross, pour out His grace from His Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Teach me to love God. Teach me to overcome sin to live always in the state of grace and die a happy death, which I wish you all. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.